video to show you how you can do it. Okay. Um, so on 1.7, uh, there was a problem. It was number 18. And I guess the empty chairs is what was confusing me. Um, what I was trying to figure out is how they were getting the six factorial. What, like, in the answer it shows 10 choose six times six factorial. They're just putting them in order. Okay, okay. Yeah, so choose the six seats, then put the students in order. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So, how can we know, because I got, I got like 210, which is just the 10 choose the six. How do we know if order will matter? Um, because that question I thought could go either way. Well, if you think about it, how many ways can six students be seated in ten chairs? The students are um, distinct. Okay. And so... So we should just... You know, so, I don't know, Bob, Sally, Karen, June, Tommy, and Billy is not the same as Billy, you know. So yeah, pick the six chairs and then shuffle the students. And that should that should get it. If you're just choosing six of the ten students to attend a meeting, well, in that case, I mean it doesn't matter. It's all you know. You can shuffle them around, and it's still the same group going to the meeting. Question 23. Um, on this one, I was trying to use the formula that was at the bottom of page uh, 46. Uh, it's actually in the example 1.7.3. I was reading it because it kind of seemed that little example seemed similar. Yeah, it might be related. They're just, they're a little different. Okay, well, that that might be what I was messing up on because the uh, the answer was different than what this was showing. I was trying to figure out what part was different exactly about it. Uh, uh, well. you're talking about it, what is the problem that at least one of them occupies its own place but here you're talking about whether two particular people are not next to each other okay so that's just a little bit a little bit different you got to think about whether these two people are beside each other or not whether they're okay. in their particular spots so then I was trying to think of the factorial because it, it's it's not too big of a difference for the answers, I don't think. Um, the n minus two for the one on one point seven point three is uh, what I was thinking would have been twenty three as well, but instead it's two times n minus one, and I, I was just trying to figure out. Um, I was trying to think of a way that I could. Conceptualize it better. I was having trouble. All right. So this is the probability. Okay, suppose that n people are arranged in a line. What is the probability that two particular people, say A and B, are not next to each other? Not next to each other. So that's one minus the probability that they are next to each other. So this is actually more like the example with the round table, except it's a line. I mean, it's a little bit like that. Yeah. So we've got um, one minus the probability that they are next to each other. So we've got n, cap n people in a line. So there are cap n factorial ways of doing that. And then if people are beside each other, then you treat them like a unit. So that leaves n minus one units. So they're 
half n minus 1 factorial ways of arranging those. But then within those two people, you can flip A and B. So there are two, two ways to do that. So it's a little bit like that problem we did um, where we had the whether the couples were seated together. So would that kind of be like the two, would that kind of be like two choose one? Is that kind of what you're doing? Or is it just? Well, you could think of it as two choose one. Okay. I mean, but yeah, I'm just, this just flips A and B. That's all it does. So they're seated beside each other, but they could, you know, A could be here, it could be here. What does A minus one mean? Like it's empty. Uh, because if A and B are together, then they're stuck together like a unit. Oh, so there's one less. Yes. So that's like cap N minus one units to shuffle around. So you do cap N minus one. And then, of course, you can simplify it and you end up with cap n minus 2 over n. Other questions? One of the questions I, I saw that on the study guide it said that we might do some groups. Would that like just be like doing multiple in the class with groups. Yeah, yeah, or in the homework. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, I could give you something that for which you should have the skills, but it would be comparable. Sample space events A and B have probabilities. Probability of A, probability of B, one half, probability of A union B is equal to two thirds. <clears throat> We know they have to overlap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And how do you know that? What is it? How do you know that? Because if they were separate, then it would be one. Or, yeah. Yeah, if they were separate, completely independent from each other, then A union B would be one. Probability of, mm -hmm, of A union B would be one. Okay. So, so yes, that's true. So, um, so we know that the special case in which A and B were, would be mutually exclusive uh, would mean that the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus probability of B, and one half plus one half would be one, not two thirds. So you could argue it that way. Uh, but if I draw, if I draw this, and I say, okay, all of this. two-thirds okay, and I know probability of A is one-half probability of B is one-half um, so if probability of B is one-half and this whole thing is two-thirds what if I do two-thirds minus one-half that would be four-six minus three-sixths, right? So one-sixth is what I would get for this piece right here, right? And so that is 
probability of A intersect, intersected with B complement. And I just did part C. <laughs> and, and then, and you're gonna get the same thing on probability of, right? So for probability of, um, yeah, B, yeah, mm -hmm. B intersected with A complement. So probability of A complement intersected with B would also be one sixth because you would do two thirds minus one half. So this would be one sixth. Okay, and I know that probability of A union B is equal to two thirds. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay, so one six plus one six gives me two six, which is one third. And so if I do one third here, I would get two thirds. So in other words, one six plus one six is two six. Third, two third minus one third is one third. So that must be the probability of A intersecting with and we know that's all two thirds. We've got one third floating around out here. And that one third, so that's probability, that's part D, probability of A complement intersected with B complement, right? One minus two thirds is one third. And if it were A complement union B complement, then it would be everything but the same. If it were what? A, A complement union to B complement would be everything except the intersection? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Right. And so I think the only question we haven't answered just by kind of looking at the Venn diagram is are A and B independent? Okay, so I mean, you know, you've got multiple ways you could solve that. Um, but what if we do, so we said the probability of A intersected with B is equal to one third. Probability of A is one half. And um, probability of B is one half. So probability of A times probability of B gives me one fourth, which is not equal to one third. So, on the test, I would want you to be specific and say since the probability of A intersected with B is not equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, A and B are, well, you could say, um, you could say that they are dependent or you could say they are not independent. Way. Okay. I think that answers all those questions. Does that help? Okay. Other questions? I actually, uh, to find the uh, part A. Are they mutually exclusive? What well, I started out with just by stating that if two events are mutually exclusive, then the probability of their intersection has to be zero. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We answered. I guess I just I should have written that up here. Probably we could just say since probability of A intersected with B, and we just kind of talked through Nick's reasoning, and that that worked as well. But you'd say since it's not equal to zero. Yeah, I, I used the other theorem. Number 27 on page 54. 
So I don't know exactly how to start this one. This was, uh, uh, most of them I can at least somewhat start. But. Okay. So a true false test has four questions. The student is not prepared for the test and so must guess the answer to each question. What is the probability the student answers at least half of the questions correctly? I mean the total number of possible oh, yeah. answer combinations? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, this actually though, this is trying to turn out to be a binomial, and so I've got to think, okay, <laughs> how am I going to, so. I was thinking that, but I couldn't, couldn't make it in my head how to turn it into that. Yeah, but um, but we haven't done the binomial yet, so I got to think. About, let's see. Okay. Well, I mean, there's still what they're doing is still pretty much. <laughs> it's binomial. It just you just got to reason it out. So okay. So what is the probability the student answers at least half of the questions correctly? Okay. If the student, let's see, so this is 1.7 over 27, okay. All right, so what is the probability the student answers at least half of the questions correctly? Well, there are four questions, so at least half would include what? Two. Two? At least half. Or, or more. Two or more, so two, three, and four, right? Okay, so. There are four questions. We can choose two of them for the student to get right. What's the probability they're true false questions? So what's the probability they get a question right? For like one question. For one question, well it's true false if you, it's like flipping a coin, oh, it's true, so false. it's one half, yeah. right? I was thinking that's what you were saying. Oh, yeah, no, it's, okay. yeah, it's true false. Oh, okay. That's so if they on. get so we're going to get two, uh, probably uh, getting one right is one half, and we're getting two right. So probably they miss one is also one half, and they're getting two of them wrong. And so then that's two questions. What about three? Four questions, choose three of them to get right. Probability um, you get one right is one half. We're going to get three of them right. Probability we get one wrong is one half, and we're going to get... One of them wrong, plus four choose four, get all of them right. So that's one half to the fourth times one half to the zero, which is the same thing as, well, this is one half to the fourth, one half to the fourth, one half to the fourth. So you could say that's one half to the fourth times four choose two. Times I've read true false test, and I kept thinking that's the choice test. Ah. I was like, what, what in the world? Okay. All right. And then part B, do you think you can do part B now? 
Now suppose the student has a sudden flash of insight, knows the answer to question, question two is false, or is the probability he answers at least half of the questions correctly? Well, then you're just going to have, then you just got to worry about three questions yeah. <laughs> instead of four. So, so then you would have three, choose one, and then um, one half to the first times one half um, squared, and then three choose two times one half squared. And does that make sense? Because you know you got one right. So what's the probability then that you get out of the other three, you get at least one right, which would take you up to a half. Okay. Other questions? In general, for any class, I would tell my students, start with your quiz first. Start with your quiz and see what you missed. And, and so um, I would start there, and then after the quiz, then I would probably go through the homework, and then if I had time, maybe look back at um, the notes. And Well, I mean, I've given you tons of stuff. It's a lot. Supplemental problems and, and so on. But... Um, yeah, if you haven't finished working all the supplemental problems, you know, you might work some more problems for practice. But I would start with a quiz because that gives you an idea as to what you might have had difficulty with. And then, of course, 1.7 wasn't on the quiz, so you got to look at that, too. Number 11 on the supplemental questions. Um, it's a geometric series one. Oh, on the supplemental questions. Yeah. Oh, I think I have my laptop with me. I can, I have the solutions right there. I tell you what, you want to read it and then. Uh, yeah. So two people, A and B, throw a ball at a target. Suppose the probability that person A will hit the target on any throw is 0.4, and the probability that person B will hit the target on any throw is 0.25. Suppose also that the person A throws the first and then the people take turns throwing independently. What is the probability person A hits the target before person B? No, no, it's right here, and I don't know. Pull stuff up. Yeah, can I just see it? Let me yeah. just look. And uh, I've got the answers too. Because it looks like I have like some old sets of problems that are here. This was the answer, and uh, I think the part that I was having trouble with was. Two people A and B throw a ball at a target. The probability person A will hit the target on any throw is 0.4. The probability person B will hit the target on any throw is 0.25. Suppose also that person A throws first and then the people take turns throwing independently. What is the probability person A hits the target before person B? Okay, so A throws first. Okay, okay. All right, so, all right, so let's go back then to the solution. So, if they're taking turns and A goes first, then it can happen on the first one. And the probability A hits is 0.4. Well, if that doesn't happen, the next possible case would be where A hits on the third one. So A misses on the first, and then B takes their turn and they miss. And then on that third um, round, A gets another turn. So probably A misses on the first one is 0.6. Probably probability that B misses on their first turn is 0.75, and then the probability that A hits is 0.4. Okay, 
Okay, and then, okay, so we'll suppose that doesn't happen. <laughs> well, then, in order for A to be the first one to hit, A would miss on their turn, their first turn, B would miss on their first turn. A would miss on their second turn, B would miss on their second, second turn. So then you would get um, probably A misses times probably B misses times probably A misses times probably B misses times probably A hits on that A's third turn. And so then you get this pattern of, so we've got All right, so this was number 11 on the supplemental problems. So the probability of Oh, no, the, the ones that I posted on Blackboard. Oh, okay. Yeah, not the ones in the book, but the ones I posted on Blackboard. And then, uh, so, so we could have A hits on their first turn, or A misses on their first turn, and B misses on their first turn, and A hits on that third throw, which is their second turn. Or A misses and B misses and A misses and B misses and A hits. Right, or and so on. Okay, so then I'm not gonna write all that out, but uh, Probably that A hits on their first try would be 0.4. Okay, so then we've got independence, so I can multiply to get probability of this. So probably A misses is 0.6, probably B misses is 0.75, probably A hits is 0.4. Plus, uh, probably A misses is 0.6, probably B misses is 0.75, probably A misses is 0.6, probably B misses. Five, probably eight. Oops, an accidental compliment there. <laughs> Do I have it on the other one too? Dang it. Okay, sorry. I, I know what you meant. Oh, thanks. All right. So, well, I'm recording this, so you know, <laughs> we don't want to throw well, anybody yeah. off there. I'll be going, why is there a compliment on that? Okay, so point four here. Uh, okay, so then I go look at my pattern here and See, I've got 0.4. All right, Molly. So we've got a geometric series. My first term is 0.4. And then this is 1 minus. What am I multiplying by each time to get the next term? 0.45, yeah. Well, it's 0.6 times 0.75. Yeah. And oh, it comes, that comes out to be, oh, I see. I simplified it a little bit. Okay. So multiplying, uh, but you could write it like, uh, and I guess I could just do some math off to the side. All right. So because 0.6 times 0.75 is what I'm multiplying by each time, and that's 4, 5. Okay. And then what's that come out to be? Okay. 8 elevenths yeah. or 0.7273. So I think my question is, um, so like in the side note, for instance, you wrote geometric series with A equals 0 0.4, R equals 0 0.45. Um, I'm, I'm thinking I missed a formula or something I'm, that I'm forgetting that, that you're probably filling in. But basically just trying to get to that, to the fraction where you get to that point. Um, you can do it how, however you learned it in calculus is fine with me. That's how I learned it in calculus. Um, but you also have a math facts sheet I think okay. somewhere um, one of your handouts came from another book that has like several different um, geometric series formulas okay. so you could look at that that's uh, I think that was the big problem point I, I was trying to figure out like, how, did, how did you yeah and if somebody will remind me I can't remember if I posted anything on blackboard or if we have a I have a math fact 
that sheet that I give out for exam one or not. I'm going to look and see. If somebody will shoot me an email, I'll try to remember to check. That's all the questions I have.